It is quite humbling to be here. Quite humbling in the face of that little documentary. Quite humbling in the presence of what was said today by the Prime Minister. It is 20 odd years that I've been coming here. I honour my people. I am a Gumach man. I am a Yunapingu. I honour my Wawa, who sits here with the table by me. I'd like to tell you something of the journey that brings me here. It begins extraordinarily early in my life, and it was only on reflection that I began to see this thread through my life of my involvement with the original people of this great land. I begin 1947, way before most of your time. I'm born in 1940, 1947, I'm seven years old. And my mother dies when I'm four. My father comes back from the war at the, when I'm at the age of five, unable to look after children. And I'm placed in a little school at Narrabeen, north of Sydney. The lake on one side, the ocean on the other. Children from broken homes, Autistic children before autism was even recognized. Deaf kids and children like myself. Broken homes, no one to look after them. And two extraordinary women ran this school. And they had t two teachers there, a man and a woman. There were about 85 kids there and the man and the woman were teaching a sort of Montessori system where they invited kids to paint and to tell stories and one thing and another. And the school had a magazine that was published. The teachers went around, both Gwen and Dorchi went around and asked kids if they had a story to tell for the school magazine at the end of the year. And as I'm sure you can, you would understand from children, they all had something to say even a little three-year-old, a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, whatever. I was not yet Jack Thompson. I was Jack Payne, P-A-I-N. I met my brother at that school because as well as these children from broken homes, there were also the children of filmmakers and broadcasters there at the school to get this sort of Montessori education and to be encouraged in that way. And uh, that's where I met the uh, boy who was to be my best friend the rest of my life and my brother, Peter Thompson. And at the age of eight, went to live with the Thompsons at the age of 10, adopted by them. I have with me a magazine from that school, a school magazine from 1947. And during that year, the teacher from the school, Gwen Annesley, went off for a couple of months to be the teacher on the set of a movie being made called Bush Christmas. Chips Rafferty was in it, this black and white old movie, and in it was also a young indigenous boy, Nisa Saunders. And Nisa came from Central Australia. And after she'd come back from the movie, she brought Nisa to the school, along with a couple of the other children from the cast. And Nisa, in the way of the people of Central Australia, clicked his boomerangs together and he sang and I heard for the first time that sound that you hear at the boom. That other language, that other culture. And 
I think, considering where it goes from here, he must have sung me. He sung me into his culture, into his people, into his understanding of the world. And he had a spear, and he had a woomera. And he threw that spear with the woomera. I'm a seven-year-old boy. We're standing there watching this guy. Ah, oh, look at that. And as soon as he left and went back to his country, we're all making spears out of bamboo and, and making little woomeras. And hey, 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 you'll hurt someone with that. Don't do that, don't do that. And after he'd gone, and our teacher showed me photographs from National Geographic or whatever it was and told me about her experience with him. And do you have a story for the school magazine, Jack? And she used to take these stories down verbatim. And I said, I left my own country where I was born, I'm seven, which was Australia, and took the big train. I missed all the lovely flowers and I missed my mother. Then my heart began to beat like an egg beater for I was happy. I was leaving my own country to have an adventure. The train puffed, puffed, puffed and stopped. I was landed at Central Australia Station. We all got off, we took our luggage off the platform and I wandered off to have my adventure. Soon I saw just one or two Mayamayas, then more and more until I came right to where the Aborigines live, the Aborigines of Australia. This was going to be my adventure. I went north of Alice Springs where I met lots of nice Aborigines. They let me go into their tribes and they let me see them go into their secret places in the rock caves. I saw them making circles in the sand, drawing maps of their hunting places. One day, one of them took me to a beautiful place down near a water hole, and I saw how he drink. And you would have thought it was a bit funny for my first try to drink like a native. One day, I was taken with one of the women, and she showed me digging for white wood grubs. A night later, they had a corroboree, a very beautiful corroboree. All the women sat round in a circle, while the men with burning torches dropped sparks on their backs. The women were not to cry. I'm not sure where I got that from. <laughs> then, when that corroboree had finished, they did one with bamboo pipes, not bamboo, I'm afraid, played by the children and the men and women danced around waving their arms to bring rain because it was a rain corroboree. I thought it was wonderful the way the natives swung their arms. They had beautiful loose fingers too. Then the corroboree finished. Oh, I had such a lot of presents from them, spears, woomeras, boomerangs, and the most wonderfulest thing I ever had in my life. A stone with a magic old story carved on it. This was a most precious thing and I didn't want to take it because I knew they needed it. But they wanted me to have it. Then I said goodbye to all, the mother, the natives, and back to my mother. My mother was glad to have me back. But when she saw me coming in the door, she saw that I was nearly a man, for I'd been away for months and months. Even though this story doesn't seem like months and months, you could pretend. She said, you must have your own adventures. Then I felt happy, and I went back to Central Australia that I love to live there. I told that story when I was seven. You think he didn't sing me? Seven years later, seven years later, without even remembering that or anything about it, life had gone and seven years 
between 7 and 14 are huge years in your life. Seven years later, close to eight, just before I was 15, I went off to El Kidra Station with the Aluara people. I was the only Balanda there on the stock camp with all those Aluara men who all still spoke their language and had their song cycles and the initiation of young men ceremonies. And I became part of that. Because in the meantime, when I was 10, my adoptive father, John Thompson, had come up here to East Arnhem Land. He had come here with the first expedition of the National Geographic magazine into East Arnhem Land. And he had recorded some of it on an 8 mil film. He came here working for the ABC doing a radio feature before television. And he came back with 8 mil film and he came back with recordings of the Bungul and of the, uh, the extraordinary Marian. And he came back to the house and the guide for that expedition came back, Bill Hani. And Bill Hani could speak five of the languages. And Bill Hani's wife was an indigenous woman, the first legal marriage in the Northern Territory between a white man and a black woman in 1927. And he came to the house and he talked of the people and their life and he had given my father insight into something of this ancient culture, and that was in the house. From the moment that happened, I was hopeless at high school. I spent all my time looking out the window. I, I, I didn't have to go to France or Italy or anything. Hey, I was remembering somewhere inside of me that adventure that the seven-year-old boy had talked about. It was just out there. And Bill arranged a job for me on El Kidra Station with the Aluara people. So I went out there. I'm there for a year. If I'd stayed longer, I might never have left. I came back, I went out to uh, work in a farm in New South Wales. I did all sorts of things, including years in the Army Medical Corps running a pathology laboratory and whatever. And then I pursued my hobby of acting and in my world of the actors I met more of these indigenous people in Tommy Lewis and in, in uh, Gulbulil as I had previously met Bob Tadawali when he came to Sydney to make some of Jeddah. This ongoing influence of this ancient culture, adopting this boy with no parents, taking him into their world, treating me like their son as I was, when I was on that cattle station. After I left there, I went and worked in a number of different jobs in the bush and shearing sheds and one thing and another. None of my white brothers ever treated me like a son, but they had. They'd embrace me with their combination of love and discipline. They had taught me like a young man and they had forgiven me the mistakes I made and pointed out the right way to go. I'm walking in the bush up there at El Kidra. An old man came up behind me and he put his hand on my shoulder and stopped me and said, Jaguar, when you walk, all right, you look here. Now, you want to look around, you stop. Now you look around. 
Now you want to walk again? Now you look here. <laughs> I was a city boy. I was busy looking here. <laughs> Simple, significant lessons for the rest of my life. And that journey stayed with me. And along the way, as part of my world in movies and music, I met a wonderful friend, Wonderboy, my brother, who was not yet my brother when I met him. I met him in his uh, position as lead singer for Yotu Indi, the band. And a fellow friend, Billy Thorpe, the late Billy Thorpe, the wonderful rock and roll man, was uh, a great friend of ours and brought his family to my place every Christmas with his daughters and New Year and spent time there. And I talked to him about this thread of the indigenous world in, in my life. And he came to the very first Gama because Mushroom Records was involved in establishing that first Gama and setting up a music studio here at the beach. He was also Mushroom Records. He was also Mundaway's agent. And Billy came back to my place and said, Jack, I've just had this extraordinary experience and you have to go. It's all that you talk about. It's everything that you talk about. It's that poem of your father's that you read to me. And so, the second Gama Festival, I came here. And I have not been able to not come to a Gama Festival ever since. Because I am happy to provide what I can. And I thank you for your gratitude for me being ambassador. How could I not be? But I have to confess, I actually come here for what it gives to me, what it brings to my heart and soul, what it stitches back into my life, the understanding that I learnt first from the Aliwara people at El Kidra. I learnt at that time of my life an invaluable lesson. Not Talk to me in words by them. Talk to me in the way they lived, in the way I observed them around me. I belong here. I belong here like that tree, like that lizard, like that kangaroo. I am this. That is central and at the heart of an indigenous understanding of the world and it became mine at the time. It remains mine. And it is renewed every time I come to Gama. That battery is recharged and I know that I belong here. It's been quite a journey. And as part of that journey, some years ago, about seven or eight years ago, actually, uh, a young man came to me. There was a great deal of talk about Aboriginal housing and how there was a great need for it. And there were various efforts made, SIHIP and one thing or another, and people contracted to make houses. And one thing, it, it didn't seem to be terribly successful. But my friend came to me and said, I have a background in timber, I'm looking around here and I can see a whole lot of Darwin stringy bark. And if these people could use a, a Lucas mill and we could teach 
the use of that mill and how to get the timber and then teach them how to put that timber together. They could build houses. How do you feel about joining me in such an endeavor? And I said, I'll think about that. I went away and I thought about it and I thought immediately of a line from my father's poem, a poem that I will read before I step away from this. In that poem, a poem called The Conqueror, the voice of the conqueror in this land, he says of the indigenous people they gathered from the living ground their common needs. Everything they needed, their house, their food, their, their, their warmth, their shelter. And I could see that what he was talking about was an encouragement for these people to gather from this living ground their needs in terms of shelter and housing. And so we established the Jack Thompson Foundation. And we came here and uh, we got a, a group of young men together out near the farm here and uh, we taught them uh, how to use the mill and to get the wood. Uh, and it was, uh, okay, uh, there's a good tree. No, no, you can't take that tree. That's my father's tree. Okay, what about that one? Oh, no, me makes sense. No, 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 that's twisty grain. What's a twisty grain? I'll tell you, that's and show you. And so, we began what I think is the first time it's ever been done culturally appropriate harvesting of timber for the needs of the community, not as an industry to clear fell from here to the coast in Arnhem Land and sell that timber elsewhere, but to take what we need from the land in a culturally appropriate way. And we did, and the buildings are still there, and the buildings that you sit in here, at the kitchen and here, all of those big trees, they all came out of that endeavor because that was followed with the Forestry Tasmania who came and gave their help and established a mill here. And then uh, Forestry Tasmania pulled back because they could see this was not an industry. None of the Ongu people wanted to clear fell from here to the coast. Nevertheless, they had harvested appropriately, culturally, this timber, and it stands there and it remains a part of my people's lives. In the last five years, the Foundation has gathered around us about 40 different professionals associated with timber and the harvesting of timber and the understanding of education and employment in the community. And we have put together a program over that period of time and some wonderful alliances with universities and an extraordinary and historic heads of agreement with the help of Gilbert and Tobin. 26 leaders of Yolngu nations in a heads of agreement with the Jack Thompson Foundation, in agreement with our plan to provide a better world for them, self-determination. And I will make further announcements in that area in a couple of months at a press conference at Charles Darwin University, of which I am a fellow. It's an exciting journey. And thanks to modern medicine, I'm still on it. <laughs> I would like to conclude by uh, reading this poem 
It's quite an extraordinary poem. I didn't know this poem when I went off to El Quedra Station, but it was written before I went there. It was written by my father when he came back from that expedition in 1950 to this part of the world, right here in Northeast Arnhem Land. It's dedicated to Bill Harney, who allowed him to understand something of the culture, and who, after all, set up that first wonderful job for me with the Aliwara people. It's called The Conqueror, and it is the voice of the Conqueror, not of my father. On this historic earth, we new men begin to feel upon these torrid tracts, the contour of our ancestral acts, the continuity of our kin, the metaphysics of the blacks evaporated like a stream far inland. Our erosive dream grew like a bushfire in their tracks. Was it myself who shouted, who fired the shot? No, no, I, I disbelieve it, I forget it. Such are the deeds a grown man puts from mind, faults, aberrations of a wanton schoolboy in a rusty shed behind the peppercorns, or far off by a pool in the lonely heat. He, I, or you, we shovel the deed under, push it out of sight in wormy wood, or fling in stones to hold it in the pool, and we make sure, very sure, there are no eyes in the yard, or by the pool, or among the wood. Hurrying away to pursue common procedures, we shoulder and shake off the damning spirit that seems to hide in blind rocks and deaf trees. Blessed are my golden girls by the slow river, blessed my golden boys by the bright sea, and must I remember the black people like shades drifting across my sunshine, or the black voices caterwauling among my cooler bars? Must I never escape from those I have slain? Nakedly, rudely, abjectly, they infested this hag of the five continents. Kangaroos more noble seem held more humanity than these black, roofless, kingless animals who shook their spears, who pointed bones at me, who spied upon me from the trees and rocks. Yet there was judgment in them. From the deep caves of their eyes, an ancient conscience peered with firmness at a meaning world. For them, no gleam of star, nor shade of shaken leaf was void or random. All that stirred or stood was individual as a snake or lily within the frame of being. Every creature was an immortal presence from of old. An everlasting dream time oceaned them, enwombed them, even in this mundane life, whether they gathered from the living ground their common foods or painted magically, sped hero-like a hunting or to battle, or all night long between the winking fires slept with their lubras and their yellow dogs. Look, now, beyond my fences and beyond my furthest axe marks and remotest roads, beyond the chartless billabongs, beyond the utmost mountains, ghosts of the noonday there still, some few last undisrupted tribes keep their ancestral custom. Distantly, with top and top, of a beaten pole gong, secretive elders from the glades of twilight command all souls to sacraments and vigils of a most ancient mystery. Now the menfolk rig and endue themselves for pregnant rites, singing the rings of red, the dots of yellow, the pipe clay stripes, the lattices of ochre that make their bodies mighty, singing the blood singing the k-pop glued with somber blood, singing the caps of paper bark, the tufts of gloomy leaves and fivered feathers, singing with plangent incantation. Totems vast, a cloud of witnesses, a throng of powers within the huge and starry church of night congregate, pressing from the branchy darkness around the mother bower, 
the hallowed space of austere symbolisms. Soon, the moon, fulvous and large and near, will shine and burn between the bloodwood trees and the lane lancewoods until, with sudden cry, with trampling tread, his reptile head to the alarming gongs responsive, dancing here and leaping there. Goanna man, about and about the bar, will dance a progress countering as of old that crocodile man whom, in former time, he quelled because his strength by faith was more than that one's strength by force. Then the relapse from action, easy jokes and lazy talk, although the songs continue and the moon ascends. The potent elders do not stir from stern abstraction, patiently awaiting at the flat trough and slackness of the night, the just conjuncture and propitious poise of deathless influences. In that instant, this bower where the sacred emblem's rest is fringed around with fire. Grasshopper men hard by the bower sit swaying in the dust with a whinnying hum. Their eyes are shut, their limbs are taut with rapture as they rise and stamp and stamp again with stridulent shrill cry. The mother dust engulfs within its cloud their passionate, unendurable convulsions set, settling slowly over them when they fall, quite spent. The lubras meanwhile from behind have run with bent heads and averted eyes to snatch the soft hot blossoms of the fire on ready torches which at once they bear away with them a wavering string of lights weaving and dwindling into the gentle dark. One lone old man as bare as any beast, white-haired and spare, above the fallen dancers stands, weeping, sobbing, howling for his country, knocking his breast for sorrow, and still weeping, sobbing, howling, as with a grievous wound. Far off and few are these who persevere. My strength by force has shown its weight and edge, and all the laws and legend of this land are formed anew. My new exactitudes of millimetre and microsecond have ousted the ancient accuracies of the napper of flints, the shaker of boomerangs, the flawless dancer. Gone, gone are the spirits from the hills, trees, taverns and lagoons, gone the belief, gone and forever gone the tribal virtue. Gone the mystic daubers from the cliffs. Gone the smokes of warning from the plain. My tools and toys, my codes, my purposes are what we live by. And here on my veranda, five black youths together, having marched barefoot for more than half a thousand miles, are boasting in their strong, rich, throaty speech of how from warrior regions through the waste. They hunted as the dreamtime heroes did, and still came trudging on camping and singing along the hero paths to have me feed and clothe and use and change them. And I will. The Conqueror. An extraordinary truth that has since 1950, when my father wrote that, changed dramatically in my lifetime. Because we have established here, as you have said, Denise, a school in which that culture is recognized as a live, significant, and primal and a, the most important part of the continuation of the oldest cultural tradition on the planet. I earned my inclusion as a Gumach man when in that second garma, when all of the 
gatherings were in old army tents provided by North Force. And one of the was talking passionately about bilingual education and how essential it was. And the administration in Darwin at the time was busily trying to suppress it and make certain that English was the first language and that the second language was not to be taught. And I, people were invited to say what they thought. And I said that I regarded that as cultural genocide. Recognized by us because it's happened to us. The English did it to the Irish. It's part of our terrible tradition. And here we are attempting to do it again. And he said, if I had the television and radio here, would you say this to them? And I said, of course I would. And they came in the next day and I did say it and it was on television on a couple of channels and it was in the newspaper and I had threatening phone calls and letters and what would you know about the territory? You know nothing about what you're talking about. And that is being recognized now in the establishment of this school here whose primary teaching is the culture in that language. At the end of that particular Garma, Mandaway and Garaway and a number of others took me over into the bush over there and they said, we want you to be our brother. We want to give you a name and that name is the name of this place. Gulkula. I am forever Gulkula. I am forever a part of this place. And those distant voices that the conqueror thought were receding into the past forever are now burning bright and bringing us and our children into a future in which we might be able to share some of a wisdom that has been gathered continuously over 65 to 70,000 years and probably more. Thank you. As a Gumach man, fire is my life force. May the force be with you. <laughs>